So let's get started. Um, just as a way of reference, uh, we have a, a group in the diocese, in our diocese in Los Angeles, that sort of deals with this issue. One of the people in this group is here. Her name is Mary. She's right over there talking to Abuna. Uh, she came with me to hear the talks and, and to be a part of this. And what we do is we think about and discuss this issue um, and, 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 and think about it theoretically, think about it the theologically, and think about it practically. Okay? Um, and what I'm trying to, to do is kind of talk about some of the things we talk about in this group. So let's talk first about same-sex attraction and what we know and what we don't know about homosexuality. First thing is we don't know what causes some people to be same-sex attracted. Okay, and that's the way I'm going to talk about it, same-sex attracted. We don't understand it. Um, there are certainly some correlations out there. We know that people who have abusive homes, there ha there's a higher propensity than normal. Okay? We know that there's some correlations with trauma. We know there's some correlations with um, daddy-mommy issues and parenting. But that doesn't mean that if you have a bad relationship with your dad that you become gay or that it's there because there are people who were sexually abused and did not become gay. So we don't really understand what causes this, right? There are lots of studies that talk about kind of these propensities, but we don't really know how this happens, right? And at some level, we don't really need to know how this happens, okay? What we need to understand is how we interact, thank you, Abuna, how we interact with it as Christians, as the face of Christ in the world, and how we are called to be in this world. Um, the next thing we want to think about is people does, Jesus does not say that people with sexual thoughts are sinful, right? Sexual instinct is, a, is an instinct in all of us, right? Just like the instinct to eat. The instinct to eat is God-given, isn't it? If you don't have the instinct to eat, you will starve to death. In fact, there are people, they get certain diseases and they don't want to eat, and they are forced to eat, otherwise they will starve to death. And if people don't eat, then you die. Okay? This is an instinct in us, and that's okay. Right? Sexuality is also an instinct in us, placed in us by God, and that's okay. Right? And so God does not condemn us for having feelings of sexuality. That's normal. This is how the world procreates. This is how we have a population. This is how we don't die out as a species. Right? So this is given to us from God. What happens is if I overeat, I become something called a glutton. Now that's a sin, and that's a problem. If I eat in an unhealthy fashion, and I have an unhealthy relation with food, that's a problem. If I have an unhealthy relationship with sex, that's a problem, right? Because God put us, He made us, and He knows exactly what's best for us, right? So if I tell my son, you know, um, he's five years old, and he says, I want to drink a two-liter bottle of Pepsi every day, I'm going to say to him, you know what? That's not a good idea, right? Pepsi, it's full of sugar, it's full of caffeine, it's full of chemicals, it'll probably give you cancer. It's just really not a good idea, right? And if he says to me, oh, you're just trying to keep me down, you're just trying to suppress me, why, is, why are you being so oppressive? And I'm like, I'm not being oppressive, bro. This is going to kill you. You're five, right? It's not that I don't love him, it's that I love him. And that's why I don't want him to drink a can of Pepsi or a bottle of Pepsi every day. Right? So God puts confines around us because He made us. He gets us. He knows what makes me happy. And these things won't make me happy. It's in virtually impossible to not have sexual thoughts and feelings in this world. You are not sinful because you have a sexual feeling. But it is sinful to act on that sexual feeling. Right? So it, I, I can't help it as a, if you're a heterosexual male, for example, you see a pretty girl and you think, that's a pretty girl. That's okay. That's normal. Now what's not okay is for me to lust after her and to maybe do something with her and do something outside of marriage with her. Now I have went outside the bounds of the way it was designed. So the instinct is good. It's the, way, it's the one God gave me. Right? But how I manifest it may not be. And that's where the sin comes in. So Jesus says that we, we are not guilty of sexual sin, but we become guilty of sexual sin when we look upon someone else lustfully. The person who commits lust in their heart, that's different than having that attraction. Right? So human beings 
we don't think choose their sexual attraction. Sometimes it's just there. Sometimes it's a focus, it's a, it's a consequence of trauma. Sometimes it's, we don't always understand what's happening, but we know that I can prevent myself from acting on those things. So when we find that someone you know, out there, and I don't want to talk about teenagers quite yet, maybe an adult, 25, 30 year old, and this person is gay, they can just be gay in the fact that they feel attracted to the same sex. But does that mean they have sinned in that state? Not yet. Maybe they're fighting, maybe they're struggling, maybe they're resisting, maybe they're pushing back, maybe they're praying that God take this away from them. Right? In that case, that's good. Keep struggling, keep fighting. And the church wants to encourage you in that struggle. Okay? So acting upon a sin or a feeling, that's the problem. So we don't say that people who have same-sex attraction are sinners. Because I don't know why they have this attraction. There could be a variety of reasons, most of which we don't understand. But I can say, so being in that state isn't the problem. This problem is when I act upon that. And that I can choose, right? I can want to lie. But if I don't lie, it's good, right? I can want to get out of a problem by lying, okay? But choosing to lie, that's the sin. Wanting to lie, that's just kind of natural. Make sense? The pain of confusion. So there are some sad statistics here, and I want you to look at some of them. One of them is the one I highlighted here in the green. LGBT youth are five times more likely to have attempted suicide than, uh, than normal, than, sorry, sorry, than heterosexual youth. So what this statistic is telling me is there's something else going on here. There is a deep sadness here. There may be depression here. There may be a lot of anxiety here. And certainly when I see people in this state, the people that I have met, a lot of them are very anxious about being or having these feelings. Sorry, I've got a cough drop, so I can keep talking. A lot of them are scared. A lot of them don't want their friends to know. A lot of them don't want their parents to know. A lot of them don't want the church to know. They are living in fear, they are living in anxiety. And not just because they're oppressed by their culture or oppressed by their church or oppressed by their people, they feel like something's off and they don't want to be like this. Right? And this is a very sad state. And this population is hurting. Data indicate that 82% of transgender individuals have considered killing themselves. 82% percent. And 40 percent have attempted suicide. This is higher by a lot than any other population categorized in, categorized in any other way. The data are mixed as to whether or not transitioning changes this rate or not. So sometimes in the world the advice that's given to everyone who's having any kind of feelings is what? You just need to change your gender. And if you change your gender, everything will be okay. You are a woman trapped in a man's body, and as soon as you become a woman and transition, all your problems go away. That is not true. In fact, so many people your age have made very life-altering decisions about surgery, hormone treatment, blocking puberty, that they have regretted the rest of their life. There are girls your age who think they are a man and they have their uterus removed. And then when they're 25, they're like, you know what, I really want to have kids now. I don't know why I did that. I don't know why my parents let me do that. What's wrong with my parents? I was 15. How could a doctor do that to somebody? How could someone listen to a 15-year-old whose hormones are all over the place? So. The, the, the story that we're often told is that sometimes this, this, this is the, 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 the panacea, the, the solution to all problems is when I transition or I come out and I just have to change, and that's just simply not true. The depression, the sadness, the anxiety, the suicide rates are consistent. 
It is reasonable to conclude that this is a very sad condition for which there is no effective treatment. This should break our hearts. All of us, as loving Christians, as people who love everybody in the world, as people who love our enemies, people who love the sinner, this, all of this should break our hearts. And we should feel for these people, for us. Suicide fact. 40% of LGBTQ considered attempting suicide in the past 12 months. And this leads us to a, just a bigger point, which is sin doesn't make us happy. Sin doesn't make us happy. It's advertised as such. And how many of us thought, if I just do this one thing, oh man. And then you do the thing, and then you feel worse after than you did before. And so the ultimate conclusion here is any state of sin, whether it be heterosexual or homosexual sin, it doesn't make us happy. So to address this issue in our diocese, we've started a new support group, for lack of a better word. It's called hisbeloved.co. And um, I just want to let you know, and maybe if you want to visit the site, you can. Just be aware of it. If you know people who are struggling, maybe they, you could guide them towards this website. There are clergy in this group who are very welcoming and very loving and there to help and give support for people who are struggling with this with this issue. Okay, so then the question that many of you are asked in the world is what's your position? What do you think? And I have to ask ourselves, you know, what's my role here? What am I supposed to say in school, at work, you know, in, in any kind of situation? And I like this quote, it says, honesty without kindness is brutality. And kindness without honesty is manipulation. And this is just another way of saying we speak truth in love always. But both have to be there. Not so much truth without love and not so much love without truth. And as long as both pieces are there, the answers come out a lot more naturally. And they're a lot more effective. I was just, just talking with someone earlier when I was, before I was, or, you know, this 25 years ago, I was working in, and I worked with a, 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 someone who's gay at, at my work, and we were very good friends. And he never once asked me what my position was. Never. And if he was to be asked, his name was Stanley, and if he was to be asked, he'd go, oh, Mark and I are buds. We're very good friends. Mark loves me. And that's really all he needs to know. And he knows I'm a Christian, which means he knows my stance. But he also knows unequivocally that I love him and that he's just a person. And, he, and I don't agree with his sin, but I also don't agree with any of your sins. And I also don't agree with my own sins. That's all the same. Right? So we have to keep that balance of both truth and love. And so what I want to focus on is either extreme today in this talk. So what's the church's position, perspective, policy on this issue? And people want to know, what do we think? What does the church think? I love this quote. It says, every person that is struggling is unique and has their own story and their own background. Everyone arrives at this point for different reasons that are actually not all that important. The church's position is that person is that that person deserves to be heard, known, and loved and uniquely guided, given their own set of circumstances, in a pastoral and loving and non-judgmental way. Place, sorry. So what's, what's the answer? What is our position, perspective, policy? You can't just have an overarching position, policy, perspective, because we're talking about human beings. Every human being is different. Every one of you is unique. How unique are you? You each have a fingerprint that isn't like someone else. That's how unique you are. And that's just one of those little touches that God gives us to say, I want you to know just how unique you are. And if God thinks I'm this unique, then certainly we can treat each other as uniquely. So there are no blanket answers that I can just tell to everyone, oh yeah, here's what you do. Here's what you say. Here's how you handle it. Because I don't know what it is. It's very unique. Each person's situation is unique. So here are the two extremes 
that sometimes I see youth falling into, and I kind of want to talk about the two different extremes. Um, so first, I'll read them to you. The sinful choice perspective. The attraction itself, the sexual orientation is a sin. Simply having a same-sex attraction, that's a sin. And it's our responsibility to oppose this, to show these people that they're sinful and to change them. This is a very extreme position. The other extreme position, celebration perspective. These people are doing nothing wrong. They have the same right to love that you and I have. And the church should bless their unions. And we have people in both camps. And what Aristotle says here, a wonderful quote given to me, every virtue is a mean between two extremes, each of which is a vice. And the church fathers always teach us, take the middle path. Don't go to the extremes. And right now in the United States, we see extremes. And people in this camp fight with people in this camp. And everyone's yelling at everybody else. Orthodoxy, Christianity always tells us to take that middle path. That's the wiser path between these two extremes. First extreme, the sinful choice. And this is something we see a lot of, both in the world, in the church, and in families, friends, work, wherever. This guy is protesting homosexuality. You guys know these words, right? These are horrible words. And he's saying God hates. God hates you. You're going to hell. That's a little boy holding up that sign. So you see here, this isn't sound like Christ at all. This doesn't sound like the way Jesus approached sinners ever. He never condemned like this. He never uniformly said, you're all going to hell like this. And what I think is sometimes happening is exactly what this quote is. You know you have made God in your image when he hates the same people that you do. So sometimes when I see this person saying, you know, God hates fags, I think, actually, I think it's you. You're the one who's full of hate. And I want to just apply that to God and say God is saying that. So we have to be very careful that we don't absorb some of these type of approaches from the world in which we live. Because I don't think they're the right approach. I want you to think about this quote. You'll either be a voice that someone must overcome or you'll be a voice that helps someone overcome. Think about that. Think about that for the rest of your life. Think about people in your life whose voice you have to overcome. And think about the people in your life whose voice has helped you overcome. And then make a decision who you want to be. So what is my role as a Christian? As lay people, as youth, brothers and sisters in Christ, members of the body of Christ, we all have a different perspective and a different role. What is my role? First thing is we're not called to judge. That's God's job. And Jesus is very explicit about this. St. Paul is very explicit about this. Many of the fathers are very explicit about this. Judgment, no bueno. That's God's job. Let him do his job. Next job is the priest job. And the priest's job is to decide what the interaction is with someone in the church. Say someone's a sinner. Say someone killed like 30 people and he shows up for communion. Should he take communion? That's none of your business. He should talk to his father in confession. And what if you know he killed 30 people? Should you tell everybody? Should you let everyone know? Should you judge him in your heart? Should you hate him? That's none of your business. His interaction with communion is the job between him and his priest. And let the priest do his job. We should not be getting involved in other people's business. That interaction is solely left up to the clergy. So what is our role? We are simply called to love our neighbors as ourselves. The way Christ interacted with all of us. This is my job. And so I want to go back to his model, his example. 
It wasn't blind acceptance, by the way. It wasn't, oh, yeah, 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 do whatever you want. It's all good. That was not Jesus' approach. But it was loving, but it was firm, and it was heartfelt. And Jesus looked at the person, and he saw the person behind the person. And once you get to that point, then you have God's love in your heart. And then you can move forward in a way that makes sense. So when interacting, connect before you correct. We love to correct. We love to speak very strongly. Sometimes I think we love to speak a little too strongly. Two people are talking about gay rights, marriage, and I barge in, I say, you know what, that's wrong. That's not in the Bible, that's wrong. And then they just flip you off and they say, get out of here. Who, talk, who asked you? Did you win? Did you do the right thing? You spoke the truth, but was your approach accepted? Was it in love? Do you really love those people so much that you want to see them go to heaven and so legal marriage is just that important to you and you wanted to correct them out of love for their salvation? No, you just wanted to hear yourself speak and you did and their response was appropriate. And so sometimes it isn't really about them, it's about us, isn't it, right? I want to I want to speak the truth. I want to let you know what I think. I And so sometimes we have to taper that just a little bit. Right? So Gottman, who's a very famous uh, uh, psychologist, therapist, um, and just, you know, he's got very good principles. He says, human nature dictates that it is virtually impossible to accept advice from someone unless you feel that person understands you. And I think he's just talking about Jesus here. Because Christ did that. He related to people. He would talk to them about seeds and trees and really simple things. These people are real simple. He didn't talk to them about Greek words and theology. He talked to them about stuff they understood. You know, when a fig tree has leaves and it doesn't have fruit and you get all pissed off. Yeah. All right, then. Let's talk about that. All right. So relating to people is our first and foremost endeavor. Understand people. Listen. You know the old adage, you have two ears and one mouth. Listen twice as much as you talk. Do that. Since each person is unique and out of respect for human dignity, we can't tell the person what to do and what is right before we get to know them. So one of the things I advise all of you, especially as youth, it's very difficult for you guys There it goes. It's very difficult, you know, I know this microphone now, it's cut out on me 30 times. Um, we have a relationship, this microphone and I. We get each other. Um, what was I saying? It was a really good point, though. It was amazing. It was a really amazing point. Um, that's right. So um, what I highly advise you guys to think about is whether or not you can engage with someone and tell them to know what's right or wrong, A, without getting to know them, and B, without fully being ingrained yourself in what is right and wrong. It's very difficult to do. And I advise you, not everyone is called to advise everyone. You don't have to convert everyone. Jesus didn't tell you to go out and change everyone. Jesus said, you are the light of the world, so be the light of the world. And St. Peter says, but always be prepared to give an answer for the faith that is inside you, which means if you are asked, you should have an answer. But my advice is not to just go out and try to change everyone with words. It doesn't work that way. It's not very effective. And people don't like you because they feel preachy. Be a light with your actions. The person needs to be heard, received, understood, and feel like they have a place in the community. Be there for people. Be loving for people. This does not mean that we agree or condone their actions, but we are affirming their struggle. 
when someone tells me I'm, you know, I, I, I just, I, I judge this guy, I hate him, I, I can't stand him, he's driving me crazy. I don't say, you know, judging is wrong. He's like, well, yeah, I know it's wrong. That's why I'm talking to you. I start with, well, you know, well, what, what, what's going on? Well, you know, he does this, this, and this. I'm like, oh, yeah, well, well, maybe he, he means that. Oh, well, I guess so, but, well, maybe you should, you know, think about some of the things you do, and, and maybe you, and I'm going to have a discussion with him. I didn't accept judging, but I affirmed his struggle, and I'm like, I get that. That's a difficult struggle. That's not the same as saying what you're doing is right. Does that make sense? The temptation is always to tell people the wrong. We love doing that. To tell everyone what we think. But that's not what Christ did. He drew close. I mean, when you read the life of Jesus, he lived for three and a half years. If you count all his sermons, and of course he gave more sermons that were recorded, he didn't do that much talking. Like, you count all his sermons, it's like a couple of weeks. So what did he do the other three and a half years? He hung out. He sat with his disciples. He walked with his disciples. He ate with his disciples. He chatted with his disciples. He was there. He was present. He made himself available to them. Right? So that's the model. Make yourself available to people. Be there for them. Such that when they do have a complaint and a problem and an issue, you are the person they come to because they feel empathy and compassion. They know you're safe. They know you're not going to talk to everyone about their sin. You know you're, they're not gonna, you're not going to judge them. People are out pushing solutions, do this and do that, you'll be free from your struggle. It's not that simple. For some people, this will be a lifelong struggle. Don't just give them a one-line one answer. And when Christ engaged with people, he just drew near. He didn't offer a position, he offered himself. Offer yourself. Be that loving friend. Be that support. Be that person that everybody goes to. Be that person that everyone confides in. Be the person who doesn't judge, the person who understands, the person who loves back and appreciates. Thank you. Don't make the sin bigger than Christ. The church is not a place of don'ts. It's a place of do's. It's not a place where we offer a bunch of things you're not supposed to do. It's a place where we, where we offer Christ himself. I mean, when, when the, the quintessential sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was offering beauty. He said, blessed are those who are peacemakers. Blessed are those who are merciful. Blessed are those who are humble and meek. He's just saying, look, here's beauty. Go for it. Be beautiful. Right? Turn the other cheek. Give someone your coat. Walk an extra mile. Here's the beautiful things. Be beautiful. Right? So let's not start with the attacks. Let's start with the beauty first. So speaking the truth is speaking about Christ. Speaking the truth is about a person, not a position. If you want to speak the truth, talk to them about Jesus' life, our Lord's struggle, our Lord's salvation, our Lord's cross, our Lord's resurrection. Talk about Him. Okay. Okay, we've talked about this. One thing we see in the studies that have come out is sometimes people who are same-sex attracted are victims of abuse. And so you don't want to be victimizing the victims. You don't want to make this even harder. If someone has trauma in their life, something that's caused this situation to, to be in their life, they need to come to the church and it has to be a safe place. A place where I'm not attacked, not judged, not hated. The church has to be a place where I can be healed. The church is a hospital. It's a hospital for sinful, broken people, including those who are same-sex attracted. It's a place of therapy. It's a place of love. And so, <clears throat> when we treat people with contempt or condemnation, this leads to shame. And when you're shamed in a place, you stop going to that place. And this is what's going to happen to a lot of youth. A lot of you guys, some of you guys, I hope not many, will feel, feel shamed. And then you say, I don't want to go to this place where they shame me. I don't want to go to the place where they judge me. I don't want to go to the place where they hate me. I want to stop going to that place. And so the only effective way we keep people in the church 
is the story of the prodigal son. What brought the prodigal son back? He remembered the love in his father's house. And he remembered that his servants had enough to eat. And that his dad was a nice guy. And there was love there. And so it didn't stop him from leaving. That's okay. But that's what brought him back. And that's what this place has to be. When this place isn't that, I give up. I don't want to struggle. I don't want to fight. I, don't, I know I'm not being supported. Okay. I'll skip that. Um, all right, I'll say this. So for those who are same-sex attracted, you have to understand that for them, this may be a lifelong struggle. It's not something that's going to get fixed in a year, or a month, or a week, or one talk. They may struggle against it the rest of their life. And you may, you may have to be that support for them the rest of their life. People aren't cured of this. Just like when you're an alcoholic, 20 years later, say you've been sober for 20 years, you still call yourself an alcoholic because you are always an alcoholic once you become addicted. And at any point in time, you can say, I'm sober for 20 years, not one drink, and then you have that one drink and you fall off the wagon and you're drunk for three months straight and you don't even remember what happened. That's the, that's the life of an addict. That's reality. So no one gets cured of these things, right? We just kind of learn to deal. It's just like someone who has an anger issue. They're going to fight that issue the rest of their life. It's your role to listen and to be a friend, not to fix. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And this is important. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. He's the comforter, the paraclete. That's his job, to convict people of sin. It's not yours. You can't make someone be convicted of sin. You can't keep telling them, you're bad, that's wrong. They may know it's wrong. Your friend goes out and gets drunk, and you say it's wrong to get drunk. They're like, yeah, I know. I'm not convicted yet. And so, what can I be? I can be support for that person. I can be truth for that person. I can be love for that person. I could be a firm word for that person, but I'll never change them. And for me to think I'm going to change them is a little bit arrogant sometimes. Either way. Treat this as you would any other sin which requires struggling. This is a process. It's a relationship. People will struggle a very long time. Be there for them. Support them. Encourage them to struggle. Keep encouraging them to push back just a little bit, depending on your relationship with them. If you have a good relationship, just keep just pushing, pushing. Just push back against it. Don't give yourself into it. There is no quick fix that you can give someone in a conversation or two. But, let you, but be that person they come back to over and over again. I'll go to the third bullet um, second. We don't want the church to come off as being hateful, and unfortunately, that's our reputation in the United States. If you ask someone in America, someone in your school, hey, I'm a Christian, what do you think of me? They're going to say, well, you're a racist, you're a bigot, you're a homophobe, you're judgmental. Is that what your friends are going to say at school? We don't have a very good reputation in the United States. And partially, it's because of this issue. Because the initial Christian reaction was so strong and so violent, I showed you some of the signs earlier, that reaction turned America on Christianity. And now more than ever, historically, people are leaving the church in very large numbers. A lot to do with this issue because of what they see and the way they see people react and the way that people hate and the way that people are angry. They're just kind of like, this is weird. This doesn't sound like you're Jesus. It's much stronger. It's different. So we need to, so St. John Chrysostom says the church is a hospital for sinners, and that's how we have to view it. This is a place where the sick people come. And if you're sick and you're sinful, I welcome you to this place. Right? And we go to the hospital when we are sick. Right? Imagine walking into an emergency room. Imagine walking into an emergency room 
and there's a bunch of sick people, right? One guy's got a broken arm, one guy's got blood coming out of his eyeballs, one guy's coughing, right? And I just walk around and I say, hey, what's wrong with you? And he says, yeah, I got chest pains. And I'm like, oh, you're gonna have a heart attack and die. Whew. What's wrong with you? I got blood coming out of my nose. Oh, you may have an aneurysm. You're probably gonna die too. Hey, what's wrong with you? I'm coughing. Oh, you got COVID. You're probably gonna be on a ventilator soon, right? And after this, I just go from person to person and I just verbally harass them. What's gonna happen? Don't you think the nurse is gonna come out at some point and say, uh, excuse me, sir, are you sick? Do you have a problem? Is there a medical condition? And then I go, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm great. She's gonna say, okay, why don't you leave? This emergency room is for sick people and you clearly don't think you're sick. This church is the hospital. If I come to this church, and I just walk around and say, hey, what's wrong with you? Oh, that's gross. What's wrong with you? Oh, you know what she does? Oh, you know what he does? Oh, you know what I heard? You know what? What are we doing? Why'd you come? Didn't Jesus say the same thing? I'm a physician. I came for those who are sick. Those who are well do not need a physician. So if you're going to come and you are righteous, this isn't your, the place for you. You're in the wrong place. Right? Because you're delusional. There was a gay pride protest in the Philippines and then a group of Christians did a counter protest. I want you to read the signs. It says, God loves you, so do we. This sign says, sorry, I'm here to apologize for the way that we as Christians have harmed the LGBT community, for hiding behind religion when I was just scared. I've looked at you as a sex act instead of a child of God. I have looked down on you instead of honoring your humanity for not listening. I have rejected and hurt your family in the name of family values. I have judged you. First time I saw these on the internet, I cried. It was so beautiful to me that you could come out and say, can we hug you? Can we love you? Instead of the other signs that I showed you earlier, God hates you. St. John Chrysostom, beautiful quote, he says, there would be no need for sermons if our lives were shining. There would no, be no need for words if we bore witness with our deeds. There would be no more pagans if we were true Christians. This sermon, this, this quote bites every time I give it. There would be no need for sermons like the one I'm giving now if our lives were actually shining. So when you ask, what do I say? I think that's the answer. There's no words if your life is shining. You don't need to give a sermon. It's your deeds. It's your love. It's your heart. It's the look in your eyes. That's what Christianity is all about. Let me ask you a question. You guys know that Matthew was named Levi. He was a tax collector, right? You guys know how much tax collectors made? You heard of Elon Musk? All right, kind of like him, a lot of money. So Matthew has the best job on earth at this point in time. He's one of not very many people, maybe a hundred, who has the best job on earth. And then this guy who's homeless says, follow me. What does Matthew say? Does he ask, uh, do you have a retirement plan? What's the salary? Do you have medical insurance? Life insurance? Um, how does this... Take the call? Yeah, you gotta take it. Yeah, take the call. Um, I'm in love with that kid. I don't know who he is. Just, um, <laughs> so what does Matthew do? Matthew gets up, leaves his table, and walks away. Why? 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 What happened? What happened? Why is everyone laughing? I'm trying to figure it out. Why? Why does Matthew follow the homeless guy? I have an answer. I think it's the way Jesus looked at him. 
because Matthew didn't get looked at very nicely as a tax collector. He got spit upon in the street, people cursed him out, people cursed out his family. If you watch The Chosen, which may not be historically accurate, it even shows that Matthew is estranged from his parents. They don't want anything to do with him because he became a tax collector. Could be very true. So why did he follow Jesus? Because Jesus looked at him like no other human being looked at him. And then what did Matthew do? He threw a party for all the other tax collectors and says, you got to meet this Jesus guy. Why? He doesn't look at us like everyone else looks at us. He looks at us and he loves us. And they just melted. And in the case of Zacchaeus, I give away half of my goods to the poor. And if anyone I've you know, lied about or, or stolen from, I return fourfold. That's the effect of love. That's what it does. So we are called not to speak a lot. We are called to love a lot. Let our deeds be the shine, not our words. All right, so that's the first extreme, the angry, attack, kill extreme. Now the other extreme. And this is the extreme I think that you see not in the churches. The first one I see, we see in the churches sometimes. This extreme you're going to see at school. And I want to talk about this one. These people are doing nothing wrong. They have the same rights to love as you and I do. The church should bless these unions. What's wrong with this thing? I kind of love this picture. I love this guy. I don't know what happened to him, but man, he's... <laughs> what, would, what would get you to dress up like that? <laughs> All right. So this is, the, this is the movement that we see. So these are some charts, this is some data, this is actually fairly recent. This is the percentage of Americans who identify as LGBTQ or something other than just normal, regular, heterosexual. And you can see the number shoots up, right, from around 2015, which wasn't that long ago, to 2021, it almost doubles the percentage of adults who, who, um, who consider themselves identify as, as LGBTQ. But when you take this number and you break it down a little further by age, you see that most of the growth is in the Gen Zers. That's you guys. And in, from 2017 to 2021, in four years, that number doubled. That's a lot. That's nothing, nothing that occurs in nature does that. Nothing. And what's interesting, you can say, well, maybe it's cultural. Maybe because we're more woke now and it's more accepted and because, you know, it's acknowledged and we, you know, we validate these feelings that more people are coming out. That's a reasonable explanation. However, why isn't it affecting the other populations? I mean, Gen Z is a very small sliver of the population. This cultural awakening, this, the woke movement is affecting everybody. Not all the other people are changing. So it's only affecting the young people. That's odd. And it's very hard to explain naturally. Because the forces of culture are affecting all of us. Why aren't people my age coming out and people younger than me coming out and people younger than them coming out? And so when you look at this number, you can see between millennials, 1981 and 1996, to Gen Z, it's double. That's crazy. That's a lot. And almost, again, very, very hard to explain in any scientific way. And so it, arguments of, of, well, this is the way all people are, and this is just, you know, we're just more, it just doesn't, it's not holding water. Then you look at where it's coming from. And it's clear that the bisexual is the huge jump. Millennials are 6%. And Gen Z is 15%. One in six people, one in six people who are Gen Z identify as bisexual. That's a crazy difference. And there's many explanations here. I don't claim to understand them. But one of the things I will tell you is that part of nature, part of naturally growing up is having same-sex feelings. 
it's okay. It happens. Part of puberty is I have, I'm attracted to the same sex sometimes. That happens. That's perfectly normal. And within the bounds of normal, there is a distribution. There is, there's not just a line. There's, there's variety. And there are people, some of the, the people in this church, parents, adults, who, had, who were same-sex attracted at one point in their life, and then they kind of got over it. And they had some feelings, and they got over them. And then they got married, and, they got, and then they had kids, and everything went according to God's plan. And this happens. One of the issues you guys have now is as soon as you have a feeling, and you say, you know, I, I don't know, I, I kind of have a feeling for another girl. Instead of someone just saying, yeah, I know, it happens, it's normal, I was attracted to some of my college friends, and we had very close, intimate relationships, but then I got married, and it was, I, you know, kind of snapped out of it. Instead, now they say, you know what? You're a lesbian. You're bisexual. You need to come out. You need to celebrate. And anyone, including your parents in the church, who tells you not to do that, they're bigots, and they're hateful, and they're trying to keep you down, and they're trying to make you miserable. This is the message of the world. And it's not okay, because it's not correct. It's not truthful. And instead of just simply acknowledging that there are varieties of normal, that's not what's happening. Instead, as soon as anyone has any feeling, everyone jumps down and starts celebrating them. There's actually a group on Instagram called GAG, Gaze Against Grooming. Have you ever heard of this group? It's a very interesting group. It's a group of people who are gay, and they're against grooming children. So their point is this, we're gay, this is the way we are. I don't know why, but we are. But we don't want anything to do with your kids. We don't want to convert them, we don't want to change them, we don't want to teach them all about whatever, we don't want to go do curriculum in the schools, we don't want none of that. That is part of an agenda that we are not a part of. And this is a very growing, a much larger growing group. They've got all kinds of child psychologists and all kinds of scientists on their boards, and they are out actively giving speeches talking about how this is not okay to mess with kids. This is the crime. The people are messing with the kids. And the kids pay the price. And you know who really pays the price? Your parents. Because the people who mess you up and tell you these lies unfortunately aren't there when you're 25 and ready to kill yourself. Your parents are. They're the ones who have to pick up the pieces. They're the ones who have to love you through this stuff. So I want you all to be careful because this statistic is saying it's, it's an astronomical statistic and it really can't be explained by some woke cultural movement. It's, it's anyway, I said enough. This is an interesting picture. Anyone know this couple? There's a couple in India. Okay, so I'm trying to get this right. It's a uh, homosexual and transgender couple. The one that's pregnant, the one that looks like a boy, is a girl. And the one that looks like a girl is a guy. And I guess they're married. And now the female is pregnant. And this couple was heralded around the world as the best, as this extreme example of tolerance and see what the beauty of the... And I have to ask yourself, is that how you feel? Is that the reaction? And why is this heralded so positively? Can't we say, I don't know, I don't think that's what God intended? That feels a little strange to me. And unfortunately, we're not really allowed to say that. If you're shown this picture in school, one of your responses is not allowed to be, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that looks right. That's beat out of us. But I want you to kind of feel the instinct inside and know that's okay. So I want to talk about this, I, I, this issue of identity. Define yourself radically as one beloved by God. This is the true self. Every other identity is an illusion. 
So this idea of identifying. I want to say that if you ask me, Archie Mark, how do you identify yourself? I will not say I identify myself as a father, although I am. I won't say I identify myself as a husband. I don't identify as an archdeacon. I don't identify as a male. I don't identify as a heterosexual. I don't identify as a professor. I don't identify as anything else. I identify in one way, as the Son of God. That's the only way I identify myself. As a sinful, broken person whose dad loves him very, very much. That's it. That's who I am. And I have no other identity. Not an engineer, not a doctor, not a father, not a lawyer, nothing. There is no other identity. So I encourage all of you to never identify yourself as anything other than the Son of God. That's who I am. That's all I am. And that's what makes me what I am. So this idea of perception versus reality, and this is something that we see out in the world a lot. You can see these guys are arguing over whether or not that's a six or a nine. <laughs> They're both right. It's one thing to treat people suffering with identity issues humanely, and I understand that. There are things like gender dysphoria, I don't know which words I'm allowed to say anymore. Gender dysphoria, that's considered a mental illness. And those people honestly believe that I am not a man, I am a woman. And they think that. And in the, um, I forgot the, what's the, GSM, DSM, that's right. In the DSM, this, uh, what does that stand for? Something, huh? The thing, right? The book of, of, uh, of, of psychology, mental illness, all these things. The DSM categorizes gender dysphoria as a mental illness. I look in the mirror, there's a boy, and I, think I see a girl. And there are many other kinds of, of, of identifying issues, right? There's someone with anorexia, she looks in the mirror, there's a skinny girl there, and she sees a fat girl. And that's a disease. That's something we have to work on. And so I can treat that people, that person humanely. I don't have to attack them, I don't want to shame them, I don't want to cancel them. That's one thing. It's another to redefine the terms because they are suffering. And that's a different thing. And that's unfortunately what's happening now. So instead of saying, look, you're suffering because you are a, a boy and you want to be a girl, now the, the solution is, no, no, there's no such thing as boy or girl, it's whatever you want to be. Well, wait a minute, it's got to be something. It's got to be some truth, right? Because all of us, we either create sperm or eggs. Nobody does both, right? You either produce one or the other. So redefining biology does not need to be the response to those who don't feel they fit the definitions. I don't have to redefine everything because someone doesn't feel, and maybe they do feel that way. I'm not saying they don't. They do. But that doesn't mean the other 98%, other 99% have to redefine the terms in order to address that feeling. Exceptions do not redefine the rule. And this is about valuing the subjective over the objective. There has to be objective truth somewhere. Science is supposed to be objective. How you feel is subjective, and I get that. And you can have those feelings, but to translate those feelings into an objective standard now, by which we must all abide, is not the solution. But that is what the world is pushing. Let's change all of the definitions in order to fit the reality of some. I really like this, uh, this quote. Let's read it slowly and go through it piece by piece. A girl with anorexia nervosa has the persistent mistaken belief that she is obese. A person with body dysmorphic disorder harbors the erroneous conviction that she is ugly. A person with body integrity identity disorder identifies as a disabled person and feels trapped in a fully functional body. This is just a mental illness. Some people think they should not have a right arm. And when they see the right arm, it hurts them. And they're like, they will ask the doctor, cut the right arm off because I feel like I should not have a right arm. This is a mental illness. Any doctor that cuts off someone's good right arm should be sued for medical malpractice. 
Individuals with BIID are often so distressed by their fully capable bodies that they seek surgical amputation of healthy limbs or the surgical severing of their spinal cord. Cut my spinal cord because I feel like I should be in a wheelchair and not have legs. Dr. Ann Lawrence, who is transgender, has argued that BIID has many parallels with GD. Hmm? Gender dysphoria, thank you. That's my assistant to the treasurer, assistant to the Archie. In each case, that's an office reference in case you don't know. There's, uh, you know, anyway, assistant manager, manager, assistant to the manager. Okay, anyway, just for the old people in the back, that's all. It's, it's okay. Um, in each case, surgery to affirm the false assumption, liposuction for anorexia. Imagine a girl who's extremely skinny, no body fat and says, give me liposuction to remove what little fat I have left because I'm fat. And you're like, um, if I do that, you'll probably die. That's medical malpractice. You don't do that. But I really, really am fat. I'm sorry. No, you're not. Amputation or surgically induced paralegia for BID, sexual reassignment surgery for gender dysphoria may very well alleviate the patient's emotional distress, but will do nothing to address the underlying psychological problem and may result in the patient's death. And unfortunately, this is the solution we see pushing out a lot in, in today's world. Get a surgery, get some hormone treatment, just you need to re-identify, you need to change, you know, whatever, if you're a girl, strap your boobs down so that you look like a boy, whatever the case may be, sometimes some of the things are even more and more egregious and scary. And what's even more dangerous is that some states protect a 14, 15 year old's right to do something even if their parents don't want it. And so now you've got a 13 year old saying, I think I'm a boy or I think I'm a girl, you're 13 and you may grow out of it probably will. We all go through these emotional movements and that's okay. It doesn't mean you're the other gender. And of course you have to understand that the corporations are profiting from all of this. Gay Pride Month makes a lot of money and the LGBTQ have nothing to do with each other. Why are they all lumped together? Because there's more power. Now it's a bigger cause. Now there's more money to be had. And people are profiting from homosexual people, from gay people, all the time. So many companies pretend to have these slogans and where we you know, support this and let's put a rainbow on everything. They just want to make money. They don't care. And I want you as a Christian to actually care and love the person. All right, so what does the middle look like? Again, Aristotle, every virtue is a mean between two extremes. Go for the mean. Go for the middle. If you guys don't remember from algebra, the mean means the average, not the mode or the median. Those are always confusing. All right. I think I've said this. All right, so what's the church's perspective, God has given us this gift of holy matrimony, of marriage, sacramental. It's between one man and one woman. And Jesus said this. He said, for this reason, a man shall leave his family and be cleaved to his wife. And it's very clear. Male and females were created for communion with each other. Emotionally, intellectually, biologically, in every way, the man and the woman complement one another. It is very important in a household to have a dad and a mom. You know why? Because they're different. Yeah, I'll say it. Men and women are different. Absolutely. The way they think, the way they feel, the way they approach problems, physically, of course they are. And that's healthy. The kid needs both. Thank you. <laughs> For a guy who speaks all the time, my throat's not very good. That's hot. Um, sacramental marriage is the only proper context for sexual relationships. And sexual union is ordained by God and thus deemed as good. So I want to say something and dispel something. Sex is not bad. God created it. It can't be bad. But the way I use it can be. 
the way I use it can be a sin. So God made sex in the context of marriage for a reason. And it's a beautiful thing, but it's not something to be abused. Just like every other, every other thing in the world, there's a way, a context, a proper approach. And there's lots of good reasons. Any sexual gratification outside of sacramental marriage is not consistent with God's perfect plan. I use this example. Did I use the example of the, of the Seven Up, the, the Pepsi, with you guys already? No. All right. That's the other one. Um, if my five-year-old son comes up to me and says, "Dad, I want to drink a two-liter bottle of soda," did I already say this? I already said that one. Okay. So this is what we're talking about with God's perfect plan. I couldn't tell if I said in the first one or the second one. This happens. I teach at USC at a, at a college, and I teach three sections back to back. Boom, boom, boom. Same lecture. Boom, boom, boom. And by lecture three, I have no idea what I said, what I didn't say, did I, did I think of saying this, did I say it twice? And then they're like, yeah, you've already said that two times. And I'm like, oh, that means I missed it in the other class. Anyway, so God's perfect plan for us is the one that makes us joyful, right? It's the one that has fulfillment. It's not shallow and empty. And this is what God intended for mankind. Pornography, adultery, fornication, it's all the same thing, and it doesn't matter if it's homosexual or heterosexual. It's the same. Heter homosexual sin is not somehow greater than heterosexual sin. It's all the same category. Sexual sin outside of the context of marriage is not what God intends for us, because it just doesn't make us happy and fulfilled as people. Okay. So I'll go through these very quickly. There seem to be three different perspectives of Christians on this, on this topic. First one is the sinful choice perspective. That means this is a sin, it needs to be opposed, and it's a choice by people to rebel against God. Second, there's the disability sickness perspective, which is saying this is the result of the fallen condition of mankind. This is a result of the fall and we all sin. The third one is the celebration perspective, which says we are to celebrate people in this state. So let me ask you, which one of these three do you think the church proposes? Look at them. I'll, don't yell it out. I'll ask you for a show of hands. I'm just curious. Oh, you put sugar in it. Thank you. That's nice. Okay. First one. How many people think our church's position is number one? Okay. How many people think our church's position is number two? All right, some hands go up. How many people think our church's position is number three? All right, so 80% of you did not vote. We'll start over. How many people think our church's position is number one? How many people think our church's position is number two? All right, good. How many people think our church's position is number three? Fewer, but still there. Okay, so it looks like the twos have it, okay? And that's a good guess. You always pick the one in the middle, right? Just test-taking skills. All right, so what is the church's position perspective on this topic? Let's see. The problem with the question I asked you is I was asking you for a policy and a position and what gets lost here is that there is a person behind this. So the church isn't about policies and procedures and rules and regulations. We have to realize that there is a person who is alone and scared and fearful. And that's the person I care about. And they are alone in this battle. And the church's position is that we want to alleviate this pain. So whenever we see someone in pain, we want to alleviate that. And so we don't offer a perspective. The church always offers a person. We offer Christ. And that's what we come to church for, to get him. And he is the one who solves the problems. All right, I'm going to think for a sec here. OK. So let's talk about speaking the truth in school, because I know a lot of you have an issue with this. Every time we speak the truth at school, we get judged, we get canceled, we get labeled, we get called bigots, correct? 
And so it is true, speaking the truth is not the same as judging someone. But unfortunately, when you tell someone they're wrong, even if you aren't judging them, uh, it, oh, but that doesn't mean that telling someone they're wrong doesn't, uh, sorry, even if you aren't truly judging them is called for in most situations. Okay, what does that mean? That means telling people they're wrong isn't always the best approach. Now they may be wrong, but telling them they're wrong isn't always what Christ did. They will almost always take it as judgment. So when a friend of yours comes and confides in you and tells you something and you say, that's wrong, they probably won't come and confide in you again. So you want to be that open person who listens and doesn't condemn and judge. If someone asks and wants to talk about this issue, then it's okay to be honest and have a good conversation about it. But what I would suggest is you not go out and attack people and tell them they're wrong and this is sin and Leviticus and Sodom and Gomorrah and these type of things. Okay, I'll stop now because everyone's getting bored and I'll take some questions if anyone has any questions or comments or... Uh, there's index cards if you want to write it and hand it to me. Don't worry, I won't look. Yeah, no one will know if it's your question. Also, Patrick's going to put a QR code if you want to text the question. Um, just zoom in your camera. I think we'll put it on, uh, on here. You can get the link and just type in your question. So you have two options. Sorry? So he'll put a QR code. If you have your phone on you, this is the only time you can use your phone. Just take the link uh, from that QR code. You could walk up if you can't get it, or write it on an index card. And please, you know, you, you, it's anonymous, but you know, have thoughtful questions, please. <laughs> oh, I... Thoughtful questions and no bad language, none, none of that, please. Also, if you want to speak, if you're not afraid to come and say a question, I have a mic. No? It's okay? <laughs> Nothing to be afraid of. Safe space. Shh. Yeah. Shh. Did you get the index card? Or was yeah, it? yeah. Okay. Shh. Let's take an in. Please, no, this wasn't an invitation to speak and talk. Just please sit down. Okay, guys, guys. Andrew asked very politely and kindly that the questions, that the questions be appropriate. I don't know who's writing what because they're completely anonymous, but please consider the questions you're sending in. I'm continuing to send in. Please make sure they're appropriate. If not, we can close the Q&A, but please... Keep the questions that you're sending in appropriate. Thank you. All right, I have to admit, some of these questions are fantastic. Patrick didn't like them, I enjoyed them. Someone asked me if I'm gay. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Um, all right, let me go here. There are some good ones. Stop quite. Okay. So one of the questions. One of the questions is. You mentioned how only males can produce sperm and females produce eggs. How and how we shouldn't have someone gender dysphoria be the exception to the rule. 
a person who, who disagrees, and first of all, I really like this question because it's so well written and it's so well framed. Thank you. Uh, unlike some of the ones who asked me if I'm gay. A person who disagrees might then say gender is different from sex. How can we respond to this? Are gender and sex truly different? If yes, where do we go from there? If no, how do we communicate that to the other person, right? So let me go through and sort of identify some terms because I think um, I probably misspoke while I was speaking earlier. So first of all, sex is um, one of two main categories, right? Male and female, and that's how we divide humans, right? And most other living things on the basis of the reproductive, reproductive functions, right? So sperm is male, eggs is female. Um, hmm? The only categories. Oh, okay, well you have main categories here. All right. um, and produces male or female gametes, right? So this is sex, and that's either male or female. Uh, Mary is a PhD in neuroscience and teaches biology at a university, so she's very smart, she knows all these things. She tells me what to say, and then I just say them, okay? And then sexual orientation uh, is basically who I'm attracted to, right? So uh, this is the inherent sexual attraction to people. And then I gender identity is this part that I think is far more uh, fluid in today's society, okay? And all right, so I'll just read it to you. The male sex and the female sex, especially when considered with reference to social and cultural differences, or one of a range of other identities that do not correspond to established ideas, ideas of male and female. So when some people talk about gender, they'll say things like, well, those are culturally defined terms. What you define as male and what you define as female is a function of girls play with dolls and wear pink dresses and boys play with you know, baseballs and, and Tonka trucks and do move dirt around. Gender includes social, psychological, cultural, and behavioral aspects of being a man, woman, or other gender identity. Okay? Now, so in, in, in today's world, everyone talks about gender. Right? And they'll say, oh, that's not my gender. You know, that's not what I was assigned at birth, okay? And sometimes that's where we have to go back to. What were you assigned at birth, right, based on your reproductive organs? Um, and so how do we get to this? There's actually a really good book that I have not read. It's called The End of Gender by someone who is um, a, a, an amazing neuroscience researcher. Um, and she talks about this gender issue. Right? And the, the basic gist of the conclusion of the paper is, of this book is that gender and sex are extremely highly correlated, much more so than the world will tell us. Right? Some people say, well, I'm a male, but you know, I, I don't identify as a male. Okay? And ultimately, that's just not true, right? because what's happening is every cell in our body is either identified as male or female. And so I think in the world what's happening is we have a lot more of confusion around this type of identification. What I would like us to think about is identifying, and it's hard to do with someone who you're arguing with, but identifying my identification is really as a person and the son of God, right? Versus identifying as a sex, right? Or a, you know, a gender or, or whatever the case may be. Is that a good answer? Kind of. You want to add? Go ahead. Thank you, yeah, I think that is a good question. And there's a difference between sex and gender, as the question implies. And I think we, as Marchie did a few times, uh, confuse the two terms. So um, when someone speaks of like, um, of their gender, um, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a female. That's not gender, that's sex. Um, but how your gender is um, how you identify, and it has a lot to do with your sex, okay? So, but it has to do with other things too, right? So there's a psychology, um, there's societal you know, norms. For example, um, in society a long time ago, men wore tights and high heels, okay? It was the men who wore tights and high heels. That was a societal norm, okay? But that was, that was considered um, a norm of the male gender. Uh, whereas today, women wear tights and high heels. Culture changes, okay? So um, how women behave and men behave, that changes. 
Sex doesn't, right? Sex is male or female only. Um, and gender, unlike in society today, is heavily based on sex, but it's not the same thing. Yeah, so what if you're transgender, right? So, um, and again, in society today, I think we confuse transgender with trans sex, right? You're like, oh, I look at me, I'm female, I, you know, I'm female, but I'm not female, I'm male. That's not true. Um, I am female, my sex is female, but maybe I have some psychology that makes me feel like a different gender than my sex. Um, if that's real, that's a real condition, um, and it's unfortunate. It's actually a really difficult condition because the data suggests that whether these people transition or not, they're depressed, most of them, and transitioning doesn't solve their depression for the most part. So, but it's a real condition. Say it again. Is it bad to like gay people? To hate gay people? Okay, I think you're kidding, yeah. Yes, it's bad to hate gay people. <laughs> I told you I love that guy. All right, um, all right, so some of the questions Oh, we're going to have the mic. I was going to say that. Okay. Should we take that first in-person question? Oh, uh, what, yeah. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, back to the role of the church um, to kind of, uh, you know, embrace, not, not embrace the culture, but to be part of the change. Um, you mentioned uh, a very good analogy of the hospital and someone walking in and saying, you know, oh, you're sick, you're sick. And uh, in a similar way, you know, um, I feel the we as a community, we have some level of fear from these kind of thoughts walking into the church. So how does a church would maintain a balance between accepting people from different mentality or these type of thoughts versus um, you know, uh, abiding to our religious and also the cultural thoughts. How do we maintain that balance between accepting people from the outside or with these different biased thoughts versus, you know, maintaining the culture and protecting the kids and all of that? Um, you know what, I, I think um, I'll answer that when I, tomorrow I'm going to talk to the parents I think I'll answer it then. I want to keep this one focused on the youth perspective, but your question is the million dollar question that I'm going to ask, get asked 11 times tomorrow, so I might as well just answer it once, so forgive me. Um, what am I supposed to do if someone asks me my pronouns? Okay? Now, here's what I do. <laughs> I say he, him, and then I move on with my life. Okay? Um, Pronouns is one of those things we just get really hung up on, and I think sometimes unnecessarily so. Um, don't make it a huge battle. It this doesn't mean you're righteous if you say, I do not say pronouns because you are and I. You're not being good. That's not Christianity, right? In my opinion, okay? So it's not a big deal. The culture now, the world now is say the, you know, you say your pronouns, just put the pronouns and be done, right? It's not righteousness, it's not a stance I need to take, it's not I need to stand up against the world. Do you want to stand up against the world? Stand up against selfishness in your heart. Stand up against judgment. Stand up against hating other people. There's the stand. That's the stuff Jesus talked about, right? Focus on that stuff. When someone asks you to walk a mile, walk two. Someone asks for your shirt, give them your coat. Pray for those who abuse you. Love those who spitefully use you. Right? This is the stance. Jesus said, deny yourself, carry your cross, and follow me. That's the stance. Right? Taking these righteous stance about something that's easy. If it's really easy to take a stance, eh, you know? So that's my opinion. And if someone says, can you please call me they? Call them they. Someone says, I'm a cat. I identify as a cat. I'm a furry. And they meow at you. Just meow back. 
you know, and just, just call it a call it, you know. And after a while, you can only have so much of a conversation of meowing, eventually they're gonna talk. Right? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Are you gonna say? Okay. Um Hi. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry for interrupting, but um, saying sexual attraction or like marriage is between a man and woman and all this stuff is speaking truth, but there's a way to speak truth compassionately. And there are times where sometimes you have to say someone is wrong if they're leading others to sin. Like the whole Paul versus Nero example. Why would Paul go to pagan Rome, right? Pagan Rome was active, actively calling for like a genocide of Christians. Christians by Nero, why would he tell him, like, a relationship with your stepmother is wrong, right? I don't think Paul was, like, trying to necessarily maybe convert Nero or thought he would, but him, what he said, and him speaking the truth boldly, set, set the tone not just for, like, his martyrdom, but aced Rome to eventually become a Christian nation hundreds of years later. So I think there's a fine line between, like, honesty and compassion, but we also need to speak the truth boldly. And I think that's very important as Christians because if someone, is, if someone spreads like science saying God hates gays and whatnot, God doesn't hate gay, gays. He loves everyone because we're made in the image and likeness of, of God, but he also doesn't want people to embrace or respect any sort of sins, including homosexuality, because that could prevent them from potentially receiving eternal life, especially if they die in their sin. Okay, I think that's a good point, and I don't, I don't think we, we, we really disagree um, on the position. I think what I'm, what I'm saying is sometimes we have to be careful in our approach. So, I mean, in the, in the case of St. Paul, right, he's also teaching everyone about Christ, who they'd never heard of. And so there are multiple things that St. Paul is doing all at the same time, and he's introducing them to something completely new. Um, and so you have to have wisdom um, because even St. Paul talks about, in the church to Corinth, if you remember, he talks about talking to people inside the church versus talking to people outside the church. And he makes that distinction. And if someone is in the church, they're to be talked to a certain way. And if they're outside the church, they're to be talked to a different way, right? If people have accepted the faith, you can push them. But if people haven't accepted the faith, then just telling them, well, you're wrong, is ineffective, right? And so that distinction comes not just from St. Paul, but it also comes from human psychology and wisdom. Right? So I don't think, I'm not saying, uh, let's call the wrong thing right. Of course not, right? But what I am saying is there is a wisdom that comes in how I approach. And I have to look at the perspective of the person I'm talking to. Right? If I, people outside the church, I don't, they're not going to react well to just being condemned. Uh, and in our state of the world, people have heard about Christianity. St. Paul was the first guy to say it. Right? Whereas in our world, it's different now. People know this position. They know who Christ is. Um, and I need to teach them about the loving aspect of who Christ is. All right, next question. Should I? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. OK. Um, should I be friends with gay people? That's a tough one. I don't think it is. Um, I think you should always choose your friends carefully. Okay? And I think you should, first of all, love and respect everyone. Okay? But let me just flip this question around. What if I have a friend who has a porn addiction and he wants to show me porn all the time? Like at the church retreats. Shows up with his phone and he brings porn. Should I be their friend? Well, gee, I don't know. Is it a good idea? Are they gonna get me into stuff I probably wouldn't have gotten into anyway? Yeah, maybe. Am I, are they gonna expose me to things that maybe I shouldn't be exposed to? Yeah, maybe. What if I have a friend who likes to drink? Are they gonna get me into things I probably shouldn't be getting into? Maybe. So there has to be a wisdom in choosing my friends, okay? Now, it's very different to have a friend who's same-sex attracted 
right? Someone's like, you know, I, I kind of struggle with these feelings. Then I'm, I'm all in. I'm with you. I'm never going to leave your side. Versus someone who comes to me and says, you know, there's nothing wrong with this. Let me show you what gay people do. You know what? I don't know if this is a good idea. I don't think this is very wise for me to have this relationship. Right? Should I, if I'm struggling with alcohol, should I have a friend who's an alcoholic? It's probably not a good idea. Right? Wisdom just kind of tells me, yeah, it's, you know, better to pick someone else. So what I would say, there is no cut, easy answer to, should I have gay friends? It, it really depends. It depends on you. It depends on them. It depends, are they in the church? Are they out of the church? What are they trying to do? What are they trying to push? Are they good people? I say always surround yourself with great people. And I want you to know that you have to love everybody, but you don't have to like everybody. You don't have to like everybody. Some of the people you just don't like. That's okay. But love everyone. I don't have to hang out with everyone. Everyone doesn't have to be my friend. I don't have to go to dinner and vacation with people. I don't have to do that. But I do have to love everyone and respect everyone completely. Make sense? Real quick, one of the youth asked uh, those three approaches you put on the screen. So what was the churches, if none of Oh, the churches, um, the churches, we don't take a position. We don't offer a position. We offer a person. And the person is Christ. So the, the answer is, we offer Christ. We bring people to Christ. And Christ is the one who does what he needs to do with people. He's the one who convicts of sin. He's the relationship. It's not about a policy and, and what's our stance and what's our, is this right or wrong? We do a lot of this, is this right or wrong? And in Christianity, there's freedom. Christ, St. Paul says, all things are lawful to you, but not all things are helpful. This is the stance of Christianity. <laughs> Some of these questions are fantastic. Nah. <laughs> um, okay. One of... Uh, yes. Can I ask a question yes. about what you said? So I think you mentioned about being there for others. Um, and then you talked about friendships, so when is it maybe a limit for me to be there for someone? Or when is it a burden on me? When do I cut in a relationship? When, when is being there for others sometimes too much for me to handle and I just can't be there for them? Yeah, that's a great question. So, have you ever guys, have you guys ever babysat kids? like a four-year-old or something, about a four or five-year-old. And then they, they're playing with Legos, right? And they're five. And they're five. And they're trying to do the Legos, okay? And they're doing them wrong. And then you go and you try to help them, and they go, no, 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 I do, I do. And they just, they, they, they're just doing it wrong, okay? Um, I forgot why I said that. <laughs> That's old, getting old. Um, oh, shoot, I had something. Yes, okay, so there it is. All right, so um, they distracted me, and it's not my fault. Um, so if I have another five-year-old who also doesn't know how to do the Legos, that five-year-old, and I say, now you teach him how to do the Legos, they're both in the same spot. Okay? So the only reason I know how to do the Legos is I've done them wrong a couple dozen times. I know that if my Lego's off just a little, it doesn't fit. I know the red one doesn't go with the blue one. And I know how they work. Why? Because I've made mistakes. Okay? The kid absolutely insists that he knows how to do it. He's positive he's right. Okay? And sometimes when you're in it, you can't tell that you're wrong, all right? So you all agree that when a five-year-old tries to do Legos and they don't know how to do Legos, you can look at them as a 15 or a 20-year-old and you can say, that's not the way you do it. It's crooked. It's not going to click, correct? You all agree? All right. Someone agrees. So now, now, let's all agree 
that you're 15 and that someone who's 25 can look at a 15 year old and say it doesn't go like that it shouldn't be like that do you see what I'm trying to tell you so Abuna's point is sometimes you're too close to the person in age in order to advise them and so what can happen is you have two kids both of them can't do Legos and they're both just struggling and you need someone who's gone through it a few times who can step in and say this is how you do the Legos let me show you how you click them together and let me show you how big of an airplane you can make all right let's get a hold of ourselves get a hold of ourselves okay so you guys are at that at an age where you can easily say, no, 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 I know what I'm doing. And what I'm trying to get you to see is that sometimes, even though you're 15, you don't. And that someone who's 25 may actually know more than someone who's 15. And so I think Abuna's point is, if you're too close, you may get sucked in. You may not understand where the boundaries are. You may not know your limits. You may get too close to the fire and the fire burns. So what I would highly recommend is if some of you are in a, a friendship with someone who's gay or have no people at school or have someone who's in the closet or something along those lines, I would highly advise you go to someone you trust and ask them. Get a perspective. Get a, get a sounding board. It can be your parents. Hopefully, and I'll talk to your parents tomorrow, hopefully your parents don't scream when you speak. Stay away from the gay people, and they go crazy. I hope they don't do that. I hope you still try to talk to your parents. I hope you still try to talk to your confession father. Talk to a servant. Find someone at church or someone you respect and get a perspective. Ask them. You know, when I go to her house, she shows me all this gay stuff, and she teaches me all these things, and she says these words that I've never heard before, and she shows me all these things, and you're like, you know what? I don't think this is a good idea because I can tell you what's going to happen soon. And sometimes it's not, sometimes it's And sometimes it's not very easy to reverse. Because once you start down a path, it's very difficult to pull out of that path. All right? You know, the, the fathers teach us that when you plant a little seedling in the ground, when it first sprouts out, it's easy to pluck out. But when it becomes a tree, it becomes very difficult to pull out. Okay. All right. What's the response to that if the parents do do that? Parents scream? Scream, or they're the ones that are saying, I hate them, et cetera. Yeah, get new parents. I don't know. I'm kidding. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, what I'm going to tell the parents tomorrow is to please remain calm under all circumstances. You know, like if, a, if the, the, the air masks, you know, the oxygen masks fall from an airplane, the first thing they say is remain calm, right? Because you can't process anything when you're not calm. Um, then I would maybe go to a buna, go to a, a, a servant, go to someone you trust and get their advice. Sorry. How should I defend myself when being attacked by a group of LGBTQ members? I have a story to go along with this question. Oh, God. I don't know. Um, I have to ask why they're attacking you. I have to ask why a whole bunch of people, LGBTQ members, whatever that means, are coming after you, what did you say? Why would people be coming after you like that? What did you do? Hmm? Huh? Has that happened? So what happened exactly? So if you just say, someone sees a cross around my neck, and they say, you're a Christian, I'm going to attack you. That seems odd to me. I don't think anyone sees a cross on the wrist and goes, let's get this guy. 
he's a Christian, right? So it must be the case, or usually is the case, that I've done something to provoke, right? And that's, that response is what I have to think about a little bit more. Let me answer this question for the parents tomorrow. So I'm going to put this in my pocket. Jeez. Um, okay, one of my school friends recently, I'm not saying, this is not the G's, the other one behind it is. One of my school friends recently expressed to me that she likes girls. She knows how I feel about this topic because I told her that that doesn't, but that doesn't stop her from trying to talk to me. What do I do? Um, I think you should let her talk to you, right? But again, going back to Abuna's point, there has to be a wisdom in how much she talks to you or what she says to you. If you feel like she's really exposing you to things that you shouldn't be exposed to, things that are sexual sin, things that are inappropriate, then I would pull back from that relationship, not because they're gay per se, but because they're trying to put you in a direction that isn't consistent with your Christian principles. But if she's someone who says, I like girls, but I'm struggling, I need someone to talk to, then you have to be there for her, right? And you be there with her in that struggle. But be very aware, and I would definitely seek the guidance of a priest or a servant or a parent and say, how close is too close, right? And have that relationship. Try to talk to parents. Try to talk to servants about these things. Because just like I told you, when you're five, you don't know you're five, right? And when you're 15, you don't know you're only 15. And things happen at this age that are very difficult to reverse down the road. So you need to be a little careful. Right? Choose wisely. Is gay unforgivable? Of course not. If you do something gay, is it over? Of course not. Should we support the LGBTQ condition? I don't know what that means. Um, I don't know what that means. What if you don't have a father figure in the house? That's a difficult question. I would say seek out a servant, seek out a priest, seek out another father figure. Right? I, I'm sorry if that's the case, if they're not around, they're deceased, or maybe they're um, unapproachable. Do your best to foster a relationship. Um, but you may have to seek it elsewhere. <laughs> um, is it bad for a girl to play with uh, um, boys' toys like trucks and whatever? And the answer is no, it's okay. It's okay for boys to not really. It's okay for boys to, you know, explore their feminine side occasionally, but not too much. Okay. How can you convince a gay friend or associate that that's wrong for them? And the question is, why are you trying to convince them of that? And if the answer is, because I love them dearly, they know I love them dearly, and they can feel my love for them, it's a very different answer than I don't really know them that well, but I need to tell them they're wrong. And those are completely different answers. All right. All the youth are on their phones, so maybe I'll just stop. Huh? Oh, they're submitting questions. Okay. That's good. Oh, yeah. Some of these are fantastic, by the way. You're, you're trying, yeah, Patrick's deleting them in real. I'm trying to read them quickly. Some of them I want to read, actually, to you guys, because it's fun. Okay, here's a, here's a very good question. I want you to listen carefully. This is a case. How would the Orthodox Church consider this scenario? Let's say there was someone outside the church who had gender surgery and hormonal treatment, something that cannot be treated after it's reversed, after it's done. This person desire, decides and desires to come into Christianity after their mistake and regrets their choice completely. Will the church still accept this person after this realization? 
What do you think? Absolutely, 1,000%, no hesitation. Of course, that's who Christ came for. Will the church still, okay, if so, how will the church respond in this case? How will they be identified in this case? The church, they will be identified the way I told you to identify them as the son and daughter of God, and that's it. And of course, they will be accepted. Half the icons in the church we have are of saints who are really, really, really bad people. And now they're on the walls of the church. So the church teaches that after repentance, nothing is unforgivable. Nothing. And there is no state. And some of the, the saints we have were the most horrible people and did evil things. And that doesn't mean anything with God. Look at St. Paul. Really bad dude. What? Tried. Good. What should I do if the behavior of one of my friends is sexually immoral and is impacting the entire group? Shouldn't it be better to isolate this person for at least a while? Hmm? What's Matthew 18? So, oh yeah, so I have two or, two or more, yeah. Um, so St. Paul says, and, and so he's reading, put away from yourselves the evil person, do not perceive evil company corrupts good habits. So when it comes to youth, people your age, um, I would say that we have to be a little careful with any sexually immoral behavior. Right? Because the fact of the matter is, if one of your friends is doing a bunch of stuff, eventually you're going to be doing that stuff. I don't think that applies so much um, to homosexuality because it's not really contagious like that. Right? Heterosexual sin is far more contagious, I think, than homosexual sin. But nonetheless, any kind of immorality by your friends, I would suggest put some distance. Right? Be wise in your friend choices. Right? Because ultimately, it is true that when you hang out with a bunch of people who are constantly drinking, guess what you're going to be doing soon? That's just the way it works. And if you have a bunch of friends who are watching all kinds of stuff on the internet, that's just what you're going to be doing soon. I remember when I was growing up, I had a friend in high school who used to always say scrub. It's just the word he made up. He's like, what's up, scrub? How you doing, scrub? That guy, scrub, scrub, scrub. That's all he said, scrub. Okay? It's stupid, but he's in ninth grade. Everyone's stupid in ninth grade. And so guess what I started saying? Scrub, right? So I said it once to my dad. Hey, scrub. He goes, hey, dad. Hey, and he got really mad at me because I th he thought I was cussing him out. But I just absorbed scrub from him. And next thing you know, I'm saying scrub all the time. And if he's, if he's dropping F-bombs all the time, guess what I'm going to be dropping after a while, right? That's just the way it works, right? We become like our friends eventually. So I would say be wise and, pick cho and, and choose wisely. Um, what if my mom, I'll just read it, what if my mom tells me I can't be friends with someone because they are gay? I don't think that's an okay thing to say. I don't think you can say because someone is gay, and well, let me take that back. I don't know how they define that term. If I have a friend who has same-sex attraction and is struggling against that, maybe realizes it's wrong and is working on it, then I don't see an issue. Just like I have a friend who likes to drink, is struggling against it, and is working on it. But telling someone you can't be a friend with someone because they are gay sounds bigoted to me. Now, if that person is engaging in all kinds of sexual promiscuity, if that person is engaging in a very immoral lifestyle, if that person is out there trying to convince you that this is correct, if that person is exposing you to things that you shouldn't be exposed to ever or certainly at that age, 
then I would agree with your mom. And so simply saying, because they're gay, that's harsh. I don't know what that means. I don't know who this person is. I don't know what their relationship is. So I would encourage you to have that discussion with your parents, an honest one. Or have that discussion with your father in confession or a servant and have an honest one. Right? And the more honest you are, the easier it is to answer this question. Is that a good answer? Is someone who identifies in the LGBTQ community group mentally ill necessarily? I say no. Or what are reasons why someone can be gay? How someone can be gay? Again, like I said, in the, I said this in the early, earlier meeting, we don't even really understand COVID. We barely are not going to understand, we're not going to understand this. Right? So we don't really know why some people are gay and why some people aren't. There hasn't been a gay gene that's been identified. There haven't been you know, enough scientific tests to, to, to... There are correlations that are out there. We see things like trauma, abuse, relationship issues with parents. These things are correlated, but again, they're not predictive. Just because someone has a bad relationship with his dad doesn't mean he's gay. Right? Just because someone was abused doesn't turn, mean they turn out gay. And there are people who are gay who are not abused. So it's very difficult to know, right? But there are certainly some statistical correlations out there. <laughs> what if someone is gay? Okay, I'm not gonna read this. I don't know, I don't know who Sean Rock is. If someone came to church and obviously changed gender and became trans, could they take communion? Good, excuse me, good question. None of your business. The priest's business. That's very easy. Let the priest make that decision. Right? The priest is going to interact with this person personally, get to know them, get to understand their struggle, and then make that decision. It's just none of your business. If a person who drinks last night and got drunk comes to church, should they take communion? None of your business. If a person who's doing whatever does, none of your business. Focus on your business. <laughs> Were there any gay saints or Bible people? Please answer. <laughs> huh? <laughs> um, the please answer got me. Um, so I don't know what Bible people are. I'm assuming Bible characters. Um, oh, you now you deleted it. Um, I'll answer it. Yeah, there you go. I don't know. Is it possible? Of course. Okay. I have no idea. <laughs> um. <sighs> We have an overnight class field trip, and a gay guy wants to room with me. I'm scared. Please don't laugh. Maturity, please. I'm scared. I don't know what I should do. Huh? The, the first thing I'll say is, um, If someone has same-sex attraction and is openly gay and is, is very flamboyant and, and, and very whatever, um, that's very different, again, from someone who's struggling. Um, I don't know why you're scared. Are you scared that they're going to attack you? Um, are you scared of becoming gay? Are you scared of being exposed to something? Um, I would hope there's a legitimate reason for your fear versus they're just gay. I don't know what else to say about that. 
And that's the end of the questions, thank God. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, guys. We know it was a long session. Uh, we hope it was very uh, beneficial and fruitful to you. Okay, let's give a thanks to... Uh... Well, we want to thank uh, Archdeacon Mark Solomon for this talk. Um, and uh, he came all the way from California, and we appreciate your interaction and the questions. Well, most of the questions that you provided. Um, but we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, two things. One, remember what he said. You know, we're blessed to have this community, right, this church community. Use the servants. If you have questions, use the priests. Don't just deal with situations on your own. You have mentors and guides here, and we're here to serve you, right? So use, use that resource and continue to ask questions all the time. If you don't have a satisfactory answer, continue to ask. We'll find it for you, okay? Number two is when you go home tonight, tell your parents to attend tomorrow's session after church, okay? Tell them to come because what you're hearing, you want your parents to hear tomorrow. So when the topic comes up, you both like have heard the same thing, right? And can talk and dialogue about it, okay? So, so take that. Also, Tazbaha will be right after this.